Shalom and welcome to Temple Talk from Jerusalem, Israel. Rabbi Chaim Richman here together with Yitzchak Ruvain. Today is Rosh Chodesh Tevet. It is the first day, Aleph, first day of the month of Tevet. 5778. It's also December 19th, 2017. And this week, Parshat Vayigash, we are reading in the Torah of the reconciliation, recognition of Yosef and his brothers, of Yaakov's arrival in Egypt, and of a kind of a happy ending to the story of Yosef and his brothers, Yosef and his father, reconciliation. But it's also the beginning in a way, of the Egyptian exile. But one thing is for sure about this week's Torah portion is that we begin to see that Hashem has a plan in everything, even if we don't realize it, even if we don't recognize it. And of course, that's one of the greatest lessons in general of the whole saga of Yosef. A lot to talk about, a lot in the news, and a lot we want to talk about, for example, the month of Tevet. The first thing, though, that I must mention is that Tonight is the last night of Hanukkah, eighth night. We're going to be lighting all eight flames all over the world. And the last day of Hanukkah is a special, special day. It's called, it has a name even. It's referred to as Zot Hanukkah, which means this is Hanukkah. And it actually comes from words in the Torah portion of Parshat Naso in the book of Numbers, where we've been reading all week long in the synagogue, we've been reading the Torah, Torah reading from the Torah reading of Nasso over Hanukkah about the dedication of the altar and the tabernacle. And on the last day, we read the section that begins with the words, this is the dedication of the altar. There's something very powerful about this day, is the point. This last day of Hanukkah, the eighth day, uh, you must open up your hearts in the deepest way and listen very carefully and hope you catch this show in time to have some mindfulness and, and presence of mind for the last day of Hanukkah because it is considered in Jewish tradition to be a day of tremendous importance. It's like all the holiness of the holiday is like jammed into this one last day we're in we are told, I'm talking now about Wednesday, December 20th. I'm talking about basically the second day of Tevet because it begins tonight. We're talking about that from on this day, from the time the stars come out tonight until uh, the next day, until the time the stars go out on the, uh, the next day, on Wednesday, there is, there is the potential for every single person, man and woman, to change, to change for the good and even, if we can go back to our favorite yearly theme of, of the High Holy Days, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and the decree that's made in heaven, and repentance, actually, on this day of Hanukkah, we have the ability to change every decree, what, even what was written on Rosh Hashanah and sealed on Yom Kippur. It's a day of tremendous holiness and an opportunity for prayer. And what you should have been doing, this whole festival of Hanukkah, as the candles burn for their half an hour, or if you use more oil or bigger candles, an hour and a half, however long they've been burning every night, you should be taking a chair and ceasing from all labor and housework, taking a chair and just sit in the light of the Hanukkah flames, which is healing for the eyes, healing for the soul, which is a reflection of the original hidden light of creation and the light of the, of the menorah in the Holy Temple. And you should be sitting there and just praying, just just praying your your heart out, sobbing your eyes out for everybody and everything that means anything to you in this world, because because the time wherein the Hanukkah candles are burning is propitious for prayer. The gates of heaven are open, wide open. But if that was ever true over the entire festival of Hanukkah, it is doubly nuclearly true on the last night of Hanukkah. And this has been revealed to us by the Holy Arizal and the Baal Shem Tov and his students, that on the last day of Hanukkah, called Zot Hanukkah, that is a day when we can merit to a tremendous influx of blessing and success in everything. And the great mystical sages of Israel have written over the generations that every person on this day has the power in his prayer or her prayer, that it should be accepted in heaven just like the prayer of a, of a perfectly righteous person. 
And so it's a day for, for really an increase in mindfulness, in heartfelt prayer, um, and um, reciting from the book of Psalms and keeping uh, and, and, and really expressing all the things that, are, that are, we have in our hearts that we are always exp- afraid to express all year long because this is really the time. Find some extra time for prayer from the depths of the heart for everything that's important to us, for, for, for all of our yearnings and aspirations and fears and vulnerabilities and loves and everything. And um, it's guarantee, money back guarantee. <laughs> so we bless everyone just like we do in, its, in the season of Tishrei, of the High Holidays. Bless everyone that's listening with a, with a good new year of sealing and the sealing of the decree. And it's just such a special, holy, wonderful time when all that light is shining that we bring into the world. So that's what I want to say about the last day of Hanukkah. Anything to add to that, Yitzchak? Anything to add to Zot Hanukkah? I think you said a lot there, Rabbi. Uh, the final day of Hanukkah. And the very propitious way to begin the month of Tibet, which um, has some other aspects to it. Which and, we'll that, get and that's to. the thing, and as we've pointed out, I, I know where you're going with that. Um, kind of a drag, right? The month of Tibet, first of all, it's uh, cold and dark. Yeah. And then we have these three days three tough of days. the 8th, 9th, and 10th of Tevet, which are days essentially of tragedy for the Jewish people. The day of the translation of the Torah into Greek, the day of the demise of Ezra and Nehemiah, and the day of the siege that was made against Jerusalem, which, by the way, boy, do we feel that. Do we feel the siege that's made against Jerusalem in our time today as well, mm-hmm. um, with the exception of the United States' veto, of course, but we'll talk more about that soon. But I want to I wanna say also, again, as we have mentioned, Hanukkah is the only festival, the only observance all year round, which bridges, which spans two months, right? It starts on the 25th day of Kislev, and it continues through the second day of Tevet. Mm-hmm. And therefore, since the beginning of something is always um, the root of its essence and its, and its light coming into the world it is, is stressed at the beginning, we must say that Tevet, by the way, the root of which that word is basically a form of the word good, right? It's a mm-hmm. form of tov. Tevet is all about goodness in a way. And um, because it begins with Hanukkah. So even though on the 10th day of Tevet, we have a solemn fast day, um, sun up to sundown, that is, which is a, which is a, um, a reflection of the siege that was made against the city of Jerusalem in the time of the first temple that ultimately led to its destruction. Still, there's something furtively, enigmatically, secretly bright about the month of Tevi, which, which, as I say, is a form of the word good. And here's how it goes. You see, Kislev, as we've been discussing, is a month of dreaming. It's a month of, um, you know, latching onto the hidden light through the Hanukkah candles, revealing it. Um... A very expansive time, the month of Kislev. The thing is, during Tevet, that's really the time to work towards realizing the dream and the vision that we have of the month of Kislev. And so Tevet is really, on a mystical level, it's about uprooting um, things that are holding us back from... Um, making our dreams come true. The negative forces within us. Um, and mostly, the great sages of the Kabbalah write that the month of Tevet is a, about making a rectification for anger, for the anger that we have within us, and opportunities that come up during the month to work on this, to work on a greater a greater connection with um, with other people and judging people favorably and seeing the godliness within every person um, and fixing all of those things during the month of Tevet. So, you know, we start the month with the light of Hanukkah. We're still lighting the Hanukkah lights. And the rest of the month, we need to f- consciously focus and refract that light. 
And as usual, everything is about healing and about becoming the people that we can that we can be. And this is what Hanukkah has been all about. It's been about about rededicating the the holy temple, and beginning that process by gazing at the candles, by praying for our, ourselves for a better world. And Tevet is about taking that and working towards it, working hard to see to it that we shine the light of our own soul uh, out into the world. So, as as ever also, we have always emphasized that Rosh Chodesh, which is today, is the, the secret of renewal. That's why the Greek empire that came against Israel in the time of Hanukkah and made decrees and defiled the Holy Temple, that's why they, they tried to outlaw Jewish observance of the new moon. Because when we observe the festival of Rosh Chodesh, which is today, which is the beginning of the new month, basically the statement that we're making is that everything can change, I can change, and things do not have to remain the same, and no two days are the same, and I'm not the same person that I was just now, because I'm constantly working on my relationship with God, with myself, with others, to become the best person I possibly can be, and that's really what the light of Hanukkah is, is all about. And even if we feel like we're standing still, each month a different light, let's say, shines forth from from God to us. Each, each month uh, encapsulates a different aspect of, of our relationship with God. So even if you feel like, where am I going? I'm not going anywhere. Each month is not just an opportunity that you have to grab. It's an opportunity that it's in your face, really. I mean, it's there and it's different. And if you connect, you know, if you turn the light back on in a room, you'll see a, a totally different picture, which is for your benefit. You know, it's for you to to grow by. And that's the other beauty of the of the Rosh Chodesh, of the renewal. It's not a passive renewal, an opportunity that we that we need to search far for. It's an opportunity that's right in our face. It's right up in front of us. We just have to be there. To and all this is why it. Hanukkah is, is such a beloved time for the Jewish people, because it's really about kindling the light. That's what we're all about, bringing that light into the world. And then during the month of Tevet, though, we, we really have to activate that. We really have to, have to um, make a stand against the forces of darkness in the world. Speaking of which, you know, <laughs> there's a lot going on that it just feels like it is um, uh, the, br bringing the whole theme of the 10th of Tevet, which is coming up soon, uh, bringing it really into into to, into modern times, into today, into into reality, that story, the story of the tenth of Teve, that fast day coming up, is all about the siege time of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, against Jerusalem. If ever there was a siege against Jerusalem, it's right now, where the whole world is just sunk in the in the um, uh, fake the fake <laughs> news, as it were. <laughs> Of, um, of, of, of their illusory uh, conception of, of Jerusalem. And the, the whole arrogant, presumptuous, um, false narrative um, that the Arab world propagates that Jerusalem is holy to the Arabs, that Jerusalem is uh, under threat by Israel, that Israel is... Um, rewriting history and somehow Judaizing the city of Jerusalem, which is the world's most Jewish city. I'm sorry, Miami Beach is not Jewish. New York City is not Jewish. The Jewish city is Jerusalem. Always was, always will be, and and that and that's basically all there is to it. Jerusalem was always the capital of the Jewish people well before the state of Israel was established, and never, ever was anybody else's capital. So since the miracle of the rebirth of the state of Israel, um, the world has had a very hard time with recognizing Israel for what it is. And since the miraculous unification of the city of Jerusalem in 1967, the majority of the world has not recognized that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. So, according to the official position of the United Nations, which basically, by the way, the United Nations is the most virulently anti-Semitic, anti-Jew, anti-Israel 
body in the world and that systematically ignores or even erases or, or even er, er, um, erases every other serious major conflict problem in the world and and dedicates so much of its resources and time to systematically condemning uh, Israel, erasing Jewish heritage, uh, redefining the narrative of, of Jewish heritage in the world, such as proclaiming that the tomb of Rachel, our mother, is a Palestinian st- site, such as proclaiming that the tomb of the patriarchs in Hebron of my, of my daddy and mommy is a Palestinian site, <coughs> excuse me, and all this jive. So basically, what's going on now is that... Um, the United, the United Nations Security Council uh, tried to, try to um, undo the, the recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital by President Donald J. Trump. And the United States ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, uh, who slammed the resolution as an insult to the U.S. and said it won't be forgotten, she vetoed it. The United States, that is, vetoed the United Nations Security Council resolution. The, the resolution sought to overrule, I'm just paraphrasing a news article here that I'm reading, sought to overrule United States President Donald Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. On the resolution, the UN resolution called on, and I quote, all states to refrain from the establishment of diplomatic relations, uh, diplomatic missions in the holy city of Jerusalem's, Jerusalem in order to prevent the fulfillment of President Trump's pledge to relocate the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. By the way, I'll just interrupt myself and uh, before I forget. Um, the Turk, that wily Turk, not, not Salozo, what's his name? Erdogan. Erdogan, <laughs> he's very excited. He says he's going to open up a, a, a Turkish uh, embassy in East Jerusalem, in the Palestinian part of the city. He's very excited. I continue now. The text of the resolution also demanded that all states comply with Security Council resolutions regarding the whole city of Jerusalem and not recognize any actions or measures contrary to those resolutions. Fourteen members of the Security Council supported the resolution, with only the United States in opposition. Uh, you know what? Um, by the way, Nikki Haley the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. also criticized the Obama administration for allowing the passage of U.N. Security Council Resolution 2334, which declared that Israel has no rights to any part of eastern Jerusalem, including the Western Wall. This stuff, you can't even make it up. Uh, No, it doesn't say that in the article. (laughs) I'm just interjecting my feelings. The ambassador told the Security Council after the vote that, and I quote, the United States will not be told by any country where we can put our embassy, unquote. Well, you know what? I'm just placing my uh, brackets here in the article. We won't be told either (laughs) by any country where we can, where we can, where our capital is. Anyway, continuing. What we witnessed here, said Nikki Haley, U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, in the Security Council is an, un- is an insult. It won't be forgotten, she said, adding that the measure was one more example of the United Nations doing more harm than good in addressing the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, Naftali Bennett, um, minister, Naftali Bennett, in, a, in an interview um, in response to a, to a um, how do you say Uyan in English? Uh, hostile hostile um, BBC interviewer mm. he said that Palestine is a fake country mm-hmm. I couldn't have said it better myself you know what this stuff is just so so remarkable and so right on time for Kislev and for this month of Tevez and really I'm speaking on behalf of many Israelis to, when I say that I'm deeply appreciative, deeply appreciative of the stand that the United States is taking. And Bibi, well, Netanyahu, he tweeted uh, after Nikki Haley um, yeah. vetoed, he tweeted, you stood up like a Maccabee. Right. You lit the light of truth <laughs> against the darkness of falsehood and all that. And all that is very, very true. But here again, Yitzhak, I mean, it's not up to, to President Trump to determine what Jerusalem is and what and, and what its borders are and, and and what the capital of Israel is. We really appreciate that support. I'm just speaking for myself now. But the fact is that, that Israel has to be resolute across the board. 
and stand steadfast in, in every decision that we make and in everything that we do, that no matter what anybody thinks or says, we're here to stay. And it's the ambivalence and it's the, and it's the lack of conviction sometimes that's, that's uh, expressed by Israeli leaders that leads us to all our problems in the first place, that leads us to go around the merry-go-round in the, of, of, uh, to, of, of, of two-state solutions and, and all the different ridiculous notions that the world tries to foist on us. Absolutely. I'd like to point out also that the um, great, uh, I put in quotes, you know, uh, struggle, the battle against the United States recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital is really being waged by and in the European Union and uh, in, by countries and terrorist groups who are associated with Iran. Uh, the, the Sunni countries like Saudi Arabia is basically saying, yeah, it's holy to the Jews. What do you want? Face reality. More and more uh, pundits and intellectuals and professors uh, who are based in, who are Saudi citizens are coming out and saying this, much to the anger of, uh, of Palestinian politicians. And other countries like, like Egypt, uh, their response has been very muted. And again, they are saying, uh, Saudi Arabia is coming out and saying, you know, the Jews have a long history in this part of the world. Respect that. They belong here. They're actually and saying what's that, all about, that by we the belong way? here. Now, the real, the, the real crowds, the real violence and, have, have been taking place in European capitals because basically it's expressing, these protesters are, exp- are expressing the policy of the European Union which is anti-Israel, anti-Jerusalem. The United States was also a very violent protest in Times Square in Manhattan. Uh, kill the Jews, you know, down with Israel, kill the Jews. It's, if anybody who has ears in their heads and eyes in their heads, it's very clear, you know, what it's all about. It's you're either a, an anti-Semite or you're not. If you're not an anti-Semite, then it's real clear that Jerusalem belongs to the, to the Jews, belongs to the state of Israel. This is the place of our holy temple. And that's just the way it is. Uh, the whole Islamic attempt to, to you know, piggyback on Jerusalem as if it's some kind of special, uh, intrinsic, holy place for, for Israel is, is just absurd. There's the music, Yitzchak. I know that we'll be right back with another very important news story. And, of course, Yosef and his brothers, Zod Hanukkah, the month of Tevet. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Temple Talk. This is Yitzchak Rudin with Rabbi Chaim Richmond here in Jerusalem, capital of Israel. As we all know and recognize, today is the first day of the new month of Tevet, 5778. It's actually the second day of a two-day Rosh Chodesh observance. It is the 19th of December, 2017. Today is the seventh day of Hanukkah. Tonight is the eighth and final day of Hanukkah, Zot Hanukkah, as the rabbi explained earlier in the show, and this coming Shabbat we read Parshat Vayigash, which is the penultimate parsha, Rabbi, that's correct. Yes, that is correct, and, and the proper usage of, of the word of, penultimate. Of, uh, Genesis, meaning the next to last Torah reading in the book of Genesis, and I always have believed that Vayigash basically is the moment in, in the history of, of creation that God was waiting for from the moment that it you know, even was, it, was, it was a notion for God to create the universe, and that is for brothers to reunite, because the whole story of Genesis has been a story of brothers finding themselves um, and uniting, uh, uniting with and in the presence of God and uniting with God's purpose for us in this world. And that's so you're really saying that Vayigash is not just about the rectification of filial strife. You're saying, you seem to be indicating that, at least in your opinion, Parshat Vayigash 
transcends this, the idiom of filial strife and takes on a universal theme of filial the purpose strife. of creation. Is that correct? Are we quoting Shakespeare? No. Filial strife, yes. What am I saying? Yes, it's a very, I think it's very cosmic that, uh, you know, from the moment that uh, Cain said to God, what am I, my brother's keeper, that uh, the answer was yes. <laughs> and uh, that's exactly what we, what we need to be. And, and we can't, God's not in the picture if, if we can't live together as brothers. Every time we, we fight uh, with our brothers, uh, we're chasing God's presence away from whoa from from that hurts from our environment. What about the the um, I don't know the irony or the or the, the the pathos of the fact that in the, in this parsha where we finally have this this reconciliation and Yaakov's joy of being reunited, um, we're setting the stage here for the ultimate descent of Israel right. into into the darkness and the and the slavery and the horrors of the Egyptian exile. I think that everything that's going on in this Parsha isn't only about these particular players, but it's truly a universal theme. And one of the things that I'm going to try to explore in this week's Torah portion video, which will be up on YouTube, is um, what all of this really means for us in terms of uh, Hashem's plan and in terms of the fact that when we talk about the final um, showdown here and the and the ultimate uh, the ultimate recognition with between Yehuda and Yosef it's not just about them it's about us also and it's about what they represent in our lives as well the different powers within us and as you pointed out just now are suggested the the intimations of the impending uh, exile and enslavement are at the moment that the brothers are united, all of a sudden you start hearing in, in almost in between the words of the of the of the verses of the Torah these suggestions that they have to get Pharaoh's permission for this. Pharaoh has to agree to that. Pharaoh, you know, embraces things, embraces the brothers, but there seems to be a slight condition to, to all of that. And all of a sudden Yosef, who was the man who uh, rescued Egypt and, and revolutionized and, and the whole the whole um um um, enchanting kind of um, of uh, confrontation, not confrontation. What's the word? The ho the whole uh, meeting, yeah. you know, between uh, Pharaoh and and Yaakov. It's it's so chilling. Yeah, there's something odd going on, and it's not a Hollywood movie with a you know a, a, a happy ending, and that's you know every the. Uh, uh, happily ever after, and and someone rides off into the sunset. No, it is a happy ending, but it's the beginning of a very unhappy period, which of course leads to the sequel to Genesis, which is of course the book of Exodus, in which once again brothers unite it, and then it will be Moses and Aaron, Moshe and Aaron. They will uh, lead Israel out of the exile and out of the slavery, but um, yeah, it's... Well, taking it further, it's all about uh, the the union of all the tribes together. That's what the secret of the tabernacle is, the mm -hmm. heart of all the tribes together. Uh, what is the verse that in the book of Psalms? It says that um, the rebuilt Jerusalem is like a city that binds everyone together. And as the sages comment, it binds everyone together in brotherly love. So there you go again, where there the whole purpose again. of Jerusalem is to resonate and broadcast this uh, level of unity. And as the verse in Psalm says, Hinima manaim, shevet achim How good and lovely is it for brothers to dwell together. And I would say anything that says Hinema tov, tov meaning good, is a reflection of the all the good that God uh, recognized when he created the world uh, and brothers sitting, dwelling together uh, in unity is, is one of those good things. It's, it's another reflection of the light um, that God put into the world. That same light, of course, that we are kindling and pondering and reflecting on throughout the days of Hanukkah. And speaking of brothers, speaking. and the importance of the rectification of filial strife, which is not Shakespeare, but a line that I just penned during this <laughs> broadcast strife. myself. I love it. And the whole idea of um, how the unity of brothers is so important. You know, uh, unfortunately, one of the issues that seems to be 
dividing uh, um, American Jewry right now from, from their brethren in Israel is uh, how to react to Trump's declaration that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And some American Jews seem to be having uh, trouble with that. They seem to be concerned. I don't know, is it, is it uh, endangering the peace process? And yes, many, many are saying that um, the declaration that Jerusalem is Israel's uh, capital will endanger the, I know this is the State Department's jive, you know, in danger, the chances for a permanent settlement solution, final solution, on Jerusalem and the um, two-state solution. You know what? Again, like Naftali Bennett said, Palestine is a fake country, and the two-state solution and the peace process itself is a fake device by which the United States, ladies and gentlemen, has wasted more money than any other country in the world, I'm sorry, but since 1994 and the Oslo Accords, did you know that the United States has donated over $5 billion to the Palestinians? Over 5 billion American dollars have been given to the Palestinians. Come and tell me where it is and what was done with it. I know that Abu Mazen lives in a mansion. I don't know um, how you can how you can talk about uh, inequality that's b being uh, given to the pa that's being dealt with with the Palestinian people, when you know that the sheer resources that have been given to that entity um, to make their lives better has actually been used to um, continue their campaign to destroy Israel, and that's the whole that's the whole long and the short of it. That's the whole thing. But maybe your worries are over, America, because uh, as a response to the Trump uh, declaration, recognition of, of Jerusalem as Israel's capital, Abu Mazen has declared that that's it. Palestinians are fed up with the United States. There'll be no more uh, relations with the United States. They don't need the United States anymore. They're going to punish the United States for this. And um, so uh, if you want your $5 billion back, forget it now that you went ahead and recognized Jerusalem. You'll never get it back. Um, because, I mean, they are just, you got to love these guys. <laughs> They're so bad. It just, it's, it's unbelievable. There's, they, they, don't, they, don't, they don't ever miss an opportunity to just look, to, 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 to express the, the evil that's, that's running in their veins. These people who, like you said, it's all about destroying Israel, and that's the long and the short of it. As, part, as far as the, the Jewish reaction in the United States to the declaration, let's face it, there are people that um, uh, I think if, if, if Donald Trump declared um, January 1st to be the you know New Year's, that they would oh, yeah. rant and rage because how could he do that? How right. could he do that? Who does he think he is? Horrible person. Right, you know, and, 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 and what his daughter shoes was wear, was wearing at the time that he said that and right. how, how could she be so insensitive listen one of the things that people are saying in the news one of the things that the, the pundits are saying and the countries are saying everybody they're saying that by the united states' declaration recognizing that jerusalem is israel's capital and this is what they're saying they're saying that the united states has disqualified itself from being an honest broker this is what they're saying. They're saying the United States can no longer be considered an honest broker in bringing about peace between the two parties. Well, I gotta say something. As far as the United States being an honest broker, there's a new story that is in the news right now which is so remarkably startling and so remarkably insane but actually, it isn't. I'm not even surprised. Exactly. Not the least bit surprising. I assume you're referring to this story, and um, I will, as you did earlier, I'll quote now from a, an article uh, that appeared online. To clinch Iran nuke deal, Obama said to have derailed campaign against Hezbollah. A campaign... United States uh, campaign led by the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration targeted the Iranian-backed Hezbollah terrorist organization. The campaign called Project Cassandra was launched in 2008 to monitor Hezbollah's weapons and drugs trafficking practices, which included funneling cocaine into the United States. Along with drug trafficking, the Lebanon-based terrorist group was also engaged in money laundering and other criminal activities from which it made some $1 billion annually. Now... 
What investigators, after amassing substantial evidence, sought approval for, pro for prosecution from the U.S. Department of Justice and U.S. Department of Treasury, those two agencies were unresponsible, unresponsive, the political report said. This was a policy decision. The, the uh, Obama administration decided to quash this investigation, which was going to lead to uh, uh, criminal charges against against individuals, organizations, I don't know what. They quashed it in order to help facilitate the deal that the administration was cooking up and had been cooking up, by the way, since 2008 when, when Obama was first elected, the deal with the Iranians, which they refer to as the nuclear deal, but it was much more than a nuclear deal because it encompassed so many things. Basically, United States under Obama flipped and they went from from being an ally of Israel and other states in the region to an ally of Iran. In, in other words, as, as is being said now about Trump's declaration of Jerusalem, they, they reversed decades of right. American po Obama reversed decades of American policy. So here we have this ironic canard, which is being repeated, that, that uh, the United States is no longer an honest broker because of de declaring Jerusalem as a capital. But speaking of being an honest broker, Obama actually... Uh, fictionalized, um, re 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 rewrote the whole narrative of Iran and of Hezbollah, and in order to push through that, this whole, um, this whole uh, restructuring of of the image of Iran, Obama ignored Hezbollah's infractions, even at the cost of 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 Hezbollah bringing cocaine into the United States of America, and of course, subsequently, he was awarded. The Nobel Peace Prize, which is right. why, uh, which is why a uh, member of Knesset de Lapid uh, made some headlines here by saying, "Why, if this is true, then that should be taken away from him. He should give it back." Absolutely, absolutely, and um, apparently, also as part of this uh, closing of the investigation, there were also uh, Russian implications, involvement in this whole Hezbollah mess that the United States. Uh, brushed under the carpet and whitewashed, which is also very ironic uh, in terms of the whole investigation against Trump's alleged association with Russia, with Putin, when we have uh, an investigation here which, which points to, to uh, Obama basically giving uh, Putin a pass when he was had agents directly involved in helping to facilitate Didn't these Hezbollah crimes. Didn't you read there's a new story today that what's her name is being investigated also for her contacts with Putin? Who's that? That woman who was running as an independent... Oh, uh, in the in the uh, elections, he had presidential yeah, elections. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking I know about. Who you What's mean. her name? It's right. Go, go Anderson look. was that her name? No, I don't know. I don't know the name. I forget the name. But, anyway, um, she's also she's also now being investigated for her her contacts with Russia. Uh, by the way, um, much to our chagrin, um, the Trump administration, while it seems to be in the process of completely reversing the the uh, Obama policy toward Iran hasn't uh, completely done it yet. And the United States still is in many ways uh, in cahoots with Iran and, and in, in collusion with Iran, supporting the, for example, the Lebanese army. The United States continues to supply the Lebanese army with, with top grade uh, weaponry, despite the fact that the army is dominated by Hezbollah. So uh, well encouraged Donald Trump right here from Temple Talk to keep on keeping on and to cut off that aid and to really turn things around uh, and get back on the right side of things. But again, it's just phenomenal that uh, the Obama administration did these things, got away with it, and even today, and even though, thank God, the, these headlines about this whole erasure of the, of the investigation uh, against Hezbollah is is raising some, is, is making some headlines, still we're not hearing, and I doubt we will hear, the, the outcry against, uh, basically, I think it's a crime. I think it's a crime to whitewash a worldwide terrorist organization when you have the evidence against them and you have the evidence they've been perpetrating crimes against your own nation with inside the borders of your own nation, and you're the president of that nation. I think that's pretty low down. I think that's pretty criminal. We'll see what happens with this. Um, if anybody's going to, anybody, let's say the media, for example, are they going to uh, take it up and uh, 
call for uh, further investigation and perhaps opening uh, charges, uh, criminal charges against some of these people involved, maybe even the former President of the United States. Who knows? Rabbi, what do you got to say about all this? I'm still thinking about still Yosef. Really, still reeling. Still thinking really. about Yosef and thinking about chapter 45 of this week's Torah portion, Vayigash, when he finally sees his little brother Benjamin, mm -hmm. his brother from his mother Rachel. And uh, we read in verse 14, Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept upon his neck. But of course, that's not what it says in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, it says, "Vayipol al tzavare binyamin achiv vayev uvinyamin bacha al tzavarav," and it says that he fell upon the necks of binyamin in the plural, mm -hmm. and that binyamin fell on his neck. And so our sages say that this is an allusion to that Joseph was looking into the future, and he was crying over the two holy temples that were going to be destroyed that are in the biblical tribal portion of Benjamin mm -hmm. in Jerusalem. And that Benjamin was crying over the tabernacle of Shiloh, which is in the tribal portion of Joseph. So what is this saying exactly that at that moment of their, of their um, reunion, that they're not in the moment, they're not really thinking about each other? Like you're talking about like brotherly love. Instead, they're like obsessing about something that didn't even happen yet. It wasn't even built yet, and they're already crying over the destruction of the temples. I think it's very, very deep what's going on here as far as what the Holy Temple represents, what it brings to the world, what is the secret of its rebuilding and the secret of its destruction. And, and they were so in the moment, actually, that mm -hmm. they were not personalizing it. It wasn't... It wasn't just about them. It was about the arc, ARC, of Jewish history and of world history. And they're realizing that how important it is for these, for these um, currents, these impulses, these trends uh, to be rectified at their very root for the sake of the nation. This was all about the Holy Temple. This is all about setting the stage of the future. And everything, mm -hmm. ultimately, all roads lead back to the Holy Temple, which is the hope of the people of Israel and the hope of mankind and the secret of, of love, honestly. Yes, and, and the unity of the tribes. It's all there. They were, as you said, they were totally in the moment, and that moment they, happens they were to spend all of history. They were in that moment, but yet they were able to transcend it yes. from its from, from the... From the um, it's particularism to right, the universal. Right, from its particulars and from it being uh, just that moment. And, and they saw what it contained, what, you know, what it contained for the future, what it contained in potential for the whole world. And of course it's all about the Holy Temple. Everything that we do is either leading us one step closer to the Holy Temple or, or putting us back one step. And, and of course the... The uh, tremendous uh, illumination of light of this season of Hanukkah is all about that, is all about taking a step, standing up for what's right. That's why Netanyahu tweeted that Nikki Haley spoke like a Maccabee and did, did so much to dispel the darkness because when we take a stand for what's right in the world, we're taking a stand for the Shekhinah, for the Divine Presence. Right. Ironically, you know, so many world leaders like to say, you know, uh, we wish uh, Israel, wish the Jews a uh, uh, happy oh, Hanukkah. Yeah, right. And they're very big on, you know, it's a wonderful thing. But the fact of the matter is that Hanukkah is the fight for Jerusalem and the fight for the Holy Temple. And that's exactly what these what leaders don't, and want. Are, are don't want. So uh, thanks for your, thanks for your uh, kind words. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can stick them where the sun don't shine. Whoa, Yitzchak. Or change your attitude. Learn, learn a little bit about Hanukkah between now and next year. And next year, if you continue to, to greet us with a happy Hanukkah, we'll be very, very pleased. Don't forget that it is uh, a tremendous opportunity in the next 24 hours or so, the last day of Hanukkah, for you to engage in serious uh, reflection, meditation, contemplation, m meaning prayer. Cry out to Hashem. Cry out to Hashem for your loved ones, for yourself, for the world. It's the, the, these, this day of Hanukkah, saturated with the eight lights, is, is just laden with tremendous potential for change and growth and spiritual blessing. 
And so too, during this whole month of Tevets, endeavor to work on the trait of anger, and uh, where the, whether we're angry with God, or we're angry with ourselves, or we're angry with our children, or our parents, or each other. Endeavor to work on that, and to bring the light of Kislev out into the open, into the fruition of these cold and dark days of, of Tevet. And in conclusion, I'll just uh, update people, uh, Temple Mount, Many, many Jews have gone up during these eight days of Hanukkah. Many more will be going up tomorrow as well on the eighth day. And again, um, it's just, uh, it's becoming part of who we are again as, as a nation, even those that people that haven't gone up. I, I'm on the bus the other day and I see a father and he's had two little children on the bus with him and he's talking all about the Holy Temple. It's just in the air. It's everywhere today. It's happening. It's happening. One more day of Hanukkah, so one more Hanukkah Sameach to everybody out there. And thanks for being with us. Temple Talk.